So today let's cover everything with solar panels because it's surely going to solve all the problems in the universe. And let's store the energy in some supercapacitors to power some low power device like an LED clock or a thermometer. And I guess the supercapacitors are probably just as suitable for this application as carbon fiber for several kilometers under the sea. But who cares if it's suitable when it's fashionable these days? Of course, if it's not a safety critical application, you can experiment, you can do absolutely whatever. You can use some cheap eBay solar panels and components and modules. You can keep it together using hot melt glue and zip ties. For example, this panel is specified 2 volts, 160 milliamps. I guess it's also specified for 100 kilometers under the sea. In reality, it supplies barely 80 milliamps directly under the sun with no clouds, right angle. Maybe some buttons from a cheap Chinese game controller shouldn't be missing. As long as the failure is not going to put somebody's life at risk, you can do anything. But safety critical things have to be designed and put together by a big team of experts. Of course, these days the team is always going to be huge because the team has to contain somebody of each ethnicity and each gender you manage to invent these days. But it should rather be some people who actually know something about it. But today let's experiment. I'm trying to build a solar thermometer, a digital thermometer with an LED display powered using a solar panel and to be able to run at night or in low light it stores the energy in supercapacitors. Of course you could store the energy in some nickel metal hydride or nickel cadmium cells or lithium ion or lithium iron phosphate cells. I mean, lithium ion or lithium iron phosphate has enough voltage per cell that you could use just one cell of course. Of course, there are multiple other options. You could completely get rid of the solar panel and use just a battery. And if you use an LCD display, like I did in this thermometer clock, it can run on batteries on a couple double A's for multiple years. No solar needed. But of course, it's not visible in the dark. Or if you use a very efficient LED display, like this pure green display, it can run on a nickel metal hydride double A's for several months at lower brightness levels. It has brightness settings, no solar needed, but solar power is fashionable and supercapacitors are fashionable, so let's experiment. Of course, maybe the self-discharge of these capacitors is going to be faster than the actual discharging current of this. Or of course, you might also go back to mains power, like my clock with a day, yet, a thermometer in and out, my weather station with humidity, pressure, powered using hydrocarbons. Everybody criticizes it, but... Without it your fridge doesn't work, your supermarket doesn't work, and the food industry doesn't work, and you're just a week or two from eating your pets. When you rely on some technology, you can only abandon it when there is a better replacement that actually works, not just in your imagination. But now some experimentation. With a very efficient display this could run at, let's say, from half a milliamp to about five milliamps. Here I have a bank of 60 farad 2.8 volt supercapacitors, 8 of them. Of course the energy density of these capacitors is about 50 times or 100 times less than lithium ion batteries, but let's try them. The energy density doesn't really matter because the box is going to be big anyway because of the solar panel. And of course let's also experiment with how these panels work indoors. Of course if this produces about 80 milliamps under direct sun, it might produce let's say 1 or 2 or 5 or 10 milliamps indoors. At best. Indoors it's typically less than 10% of the outdoors under the sun. But also some solar panels are not very efficient at low light. So for example at 10% of the nominal illumination they can produce significantly less than 10% of the current. It can also easily be zero current. And these Chinese solar panels are typically rated half a volt per individual cell. And this 2 volt one, for example, is made of 4 cells in a series. And this one has 10 cells in a series and they call it 5 volts. This one 11 cells and they call it 5.5 volts. And this one is called 9 volts because it has 18 cells in it in series. It's 9 and another 9 in a series. But for now I rewire these two sections in a parallel instead of series. It used to be one section, the connection and another section in a series. I broke the connection here and put these two sections in a parallel. So it's now producing 4.5 volts. And by this I mean 4.5 nominal. But of course the voltage depends on the light, illumination and the load. These are typically producing about 0.5 or 0.55 volts under the sun but less under the load. 
and indoors it can be like 0 0.3 or 0 0.4, 0 0.45 volts per cell, and even less when loaded. Indoors the voltage per cell is going to be about 20 or 30 percent less, and of course when you load a solar cell up to a point the voltage doesn't go down much with the load, but there is a certain point where the voltage starts plummeting a lot with a little extra load. So it's of course best to use the solar cell in this region, basically the maximum power point, when you're getting near the maximum current, but still also getting near the maximum voltage. But of course when using the solar cells with no controller, just connecting them to a battery or capacitor being charged, the fully charged voltage should be actually below this, to keep the current near the maximum in this region. Because if the voltage is just a little bit higher on the battery or capacitor, then the current is suddenly much lower. And also it's better to use a solar cell rated for a bit higher voltage, because then it can run even at a lower light. For example this cell is 2 volts and it's typically used to charge a single nickel metal hydride battery, which during charging has about 1.4 or 1.5 volts, but it's always better to have some voltage headroom. For example these solar lights have four cells in a series as you can see, and this is charging a single nickel metal hydride battery, or a cell actually, not a battery, because it's just one cell. I'm using 2.8 volt capacitors, but I'm charging them to just 2.5 volts to prolong their life. And I'm thinking I need about 7, 8, 9 or 10 cells in a series for this to charge them in low light. You could for example put these two in a series to get 8 cells in a series, but I'm probably going to use this bigger panel. Now it's two in a parallel and nine in a series. And I'm using TL431 to limit the voltage on the capacitors at 2.5 volts. And this works way better than a Zener. I explained this in a couple of last videos. And it seems the combination of nine cells in a series and these eight parallel supercapacitors, a TL431 and this red display seems to work. Now it's actually a bit dim under studio lights, but in a normal room light conditions it's readable. Here is the partial schematic of this prototype, here is the solar cell, a Schottky diode charging these capacitors in a parallel, but each of them has a series resistor, this is for two reasons. If one of them goes short internally, it does not short the others, and also if the load shorts, it limits the current to about a couple hundred milliamps instead of hundreds of amps. And this greatly reduces the risk of fire. The charging voltage is limited using TL431 here in the two terminal configuration. And here the voltage goes into the thermometer circuitry. And there is also some voltage sensing on the cell, on the solar cell, which can basically dim the display at night. And of course because this produces just 2.5 volts, the display has to be red or yellow or yellow green or orange, basically the ones with a lower voltage drop. These drop about 1.6 volts at very low currents, and about 1.9 volts at high currents. On the other hand, a pure green or a white or a blue display drops about 2.4 volts at very low currents and almost 3 volts at high currents. So to for example use a pure green display powered from supercapacitors, you'd have to put two capacitors in a series or two groups in a series, whereas the red one can run on just a single capacitor or all of them in a parallel. Of course for this application I was looking for the most efficient LED displays. By far the most efficient is this pure green one, but its voltage drop is a bit too high for a 2.5 volt voltage supply. Red display is about 5 times less efficient, but it can reliably run at 2.5 volts. And of course when using the red display I can rearrange this into two parallel sections, for the green one I would have to have all in a series, which would double the voltage but half the current. And also for some reason I prefer red displays or yellow or yellow green or orange, because in dark you can see just the display. A pure green or a white or a blue display, in the dark you can see not just the display, but also the light it throws on the walls a couple meters away. Because human vision is probably much more sensitive in dark to shorter wavelengths. So if you want to use it in a room where somebody sleeps, the wavelength has to be over 570 nanometers roughly. And maybe it's just my vision, but I noticed that the red display is much better readable from distance than the green one, despite being the same size. So these are the reasons I might use the red one instead of the green one, despite it's less efficient. But still the red one is the most efficient out of the lower voltage ones, red, orange, yellow and yellow green. And it's strange that the yellow green is the least efficient, 
and the pure green is the most efficient. Both are called green, but the yellow green is about 570 or 575 nanometers, whereas the pure green is about 525 nanometers. Different green technologies are almost 50 nanometers apart. And it makes a massive difference. The yellow green is still better visible from distance and it also doesn't illuminate the whole room. To use the pure green display I would have to use this configuration with two series groups of capacitors. This charges up to 5 volts. I already tested this and it works well. And it's better from the efficiency point. But I just personally don't like the green display. It lights up the whole room even when it's dim at night. Whereas the red display can be bright and still not lighting up the room. And I'm able to read the green one from about 4 or 5 meters. The red one from about 10 meters. Not sure why, maybe it's just my vision having much better resolution for red or yellow or orange and a poor resolution for blue or pure green. And the schematic of the thermometer itself is probably going to be almost the same as this one, which I was already showing in some video. I might put a link in the description to it. And of course these LED displays, to be nicely readable, always have to have some dark filter over them. This also has the brightness setting. And it's quite dim. Maybe I already discharged my capacitors now. But anyway, without the filter, the display is very poorly readable because you can see the inactive segments. You have to have a filter dark enough so the inactive segments are almost invisible. And believe it or not, some makers still don't get this right. For example, this USB tester. A display with no dark filter on it. This is just horrible. For example, this one gets it right. The filter makes the inactive display segments barely visible. And I'm also wondering what's the spectral sensitivity of these panels. I noticed some oddities when trying to use these indoors. Of course when you put this panel indoors, it can see some part of the sky through the window. And when it's sunny with completely no clouds, completely blue sky, and the panel can basically see the blue sky but not the sun directly, it produces very little current or no current at all. On the other hand, when it's cloudy, it produces much more current. So I guess it's not very sensitive to blue. When it sees the blue sky it produces almost nothing, but when it sees a cloud through the window it produces significantly more. It might actually have low sensitivity to blue and higher sensitivity to orange, red or even infrared. Trying the green display at just 2.5 volts or even less because it's already a bit discharged. And it produces a little bit of light, but you have to keep in mind that when using capacitors for energy storage, you have to allow for quite a voltage travel to use a significant portion of their energy storage capability. Because when you're discharging a capacitor, the voltage on it goes linearly down at a constant current. Of course I wanted to draw a straight line, this is the maximum charging voltage. Whereas in batteries, the discharge curve is much more flat. It can look, for example, like this. So when powering something from a capacitor, the device has to be able to run at a much wider voltage range than when powering it from a battery. If I use the green display which drops more voltage and I start at 2.5 volts, the display discharges just a little bit of the energy in the capacitors and now the voltage is too low for the green display and it produces no light. Whereas with the red display, it can go much lower with the voltage and use much more energy from the capacitors. And one interesting measurement. Having this panel split into two individual sections, I can measure each section separately. To see how the sections in one panel differ from each other. I guess all the bits in one panel would be identical if it's a good quality panel. But in this eBay panel, the halves differ quite a lot. In direct right angle sun, the short circuit current of this half is 165 milliamps, and the short circuit current of this half is just 105 milliamps. That's a 60% difference, that's quite a lot. But the open circuit voltages don't differ much. And here it's again sun at right angle but going through a window. And now it's suddenly just 90 milliamps and 63 milliamps. So it seems the window actually absorbs quite a lot of the light. And there is again a significant difference in the short circuit current between the halves. And the open circuit voltages are again quite similar. And the last measurement was without the direct sun. The panel could just see blue sky through a window. And each section was producing just about one milliamp. 
And now, strangely, the currents are very similar, and even more strangely, now the open circuit voltages are quite different. But what surprised me the most is that the half that produced a higher current in the sun produces significantly less open circuit voltage in low light conditions. I would expect one half of it to be overall better quality and producing more current and more voltage, but no. The half producing less short circuit current in the sun produces more open circuit voltage in low light. I'm not a big expert on solar panels, so I don't have any explanation for this. And of course there are several different types of solar panels, like monocrystallic, polycrystallic, amorphous, whatever chinesium comes from eBay. And of course some of the solar panels are optimized for direct sunlight, some of them might be for indoor use, like the panels in calculators. The performance of solar panels indoors is really quite poor and unpredictable, and it seems this size of a panel just barely produces enough for this display, the red one, or these four panels combined. With the more efficient green display there is more headroom. But the red display is more readable for me, for some reason. I might have a slight myopia, and the chromatic aberration might be compensating for this, in the case of the red light. I mean, in this digital age full of screens, who's not at least slightly short-sighted from this. Your vision is basically adjusting based on how it's used most of the time. And yes, technically myopia is reversible, but in reality for most people it isn't. Reversing myopia is like losing weight when you're fat. It's possible, but it requires a lot of effort and a complete change in your lifestyle, so for most people it ends up impossible. I'm still not decided whether to use the green display or the red display, or I might just build a solar roadway here. A solar freaking roadway. If it's really that easy to convince investors to invest in such nonsense, the future of technology is completely screwed. A meaningful technology can be completely forgotten and an absolute nonsense can become the future, when the future of technology is decided by people who don't understand it. What technology is going to be the future is typically decided by politicians, by banning some technology or subsidizing some other technology, but these don't really understand it. It's also decided by investors, based on what they invest into, but again they often don't understand it enough. And of course the technology of future is also decided by the customers or consumers based on what they buy, but again most of them don't understand it. So the future of technology is really quite uncertain. It's a bit unsettling when everything depends on technology, yet most people know nothing about it. The technology is getting more and more complex, yet people are getting more and more dumb. Everything's so convenient, people have no incentive to develop a brain. And of course the readability of the display greatly depends on the filter. You can give it a filter in the color of the display or some neutral filter like this or combination of two. It looks way better when it's not under studio lights, of course. Throughout this video it looks very dim, but I'm using very bright lights for the camera to have a tiny aperture maximizing the depth of field. And of course this video is getting bloody long, so let's continue in the next episode. That's it then. If you like my videos, please consider supporting my channel on Patreon using the thanks button or subscribing. And big thanks to all of you who already support me. You keep this channel running.